Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to echo what everyone else has said so far. Thank you very much to the organisers for putting together, so far at least, an excellent conference. Uh, great range of speakers, great range of topics, really enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you for the personal invitation as well. It's always nice to uh, come and talk about your own work, isn't it? But uh, to do so with the hospitality of the Bank of Spain in this magnificent building is really quite special. So, so thank you. There's another reason why I'm quite uh, glad to be at the Bank of Spain talking about longevity. Uh, and it's a little bit autobiographical. And I, I thought, I'm taking a bit of a gamble now because it's been a long day. Yeah? A great content, but it's a long day. And we heard earlier about cognitive overload from James, <laughs> uh, and particularly as advancing years. So uh, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit different uh, and uh, go very big picture. But also explain a little bit why I'm delighted to be back here at the Bank of Spain. Because uh, I've been here before for many a conference and given seminars here. Because for most of my career, 25, 30 years, I focused on things macroeconomists typically focus on, you know, GDP growth, business cycles, monetary policy, fiscal policy, debt management. Then about 10 years ago, I just got obsessed with longevity, and that's now what all my research is about. Uh, but I haven't been to the Bank of Spain to talk about longevity uh, in those 10 years. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about why I got into this topic, which is that at London Business School, I teach a course called World Economy, Problems and Prospects. It's more problems than prospects right now, but anyway. Uh, and I teach MBA students about the short and long run trends that are going to shape the economy and what it means for business. And within that, I would give a lecture on the ageing society. And uh, you know, it's been floating around in the background of everything we've been saying. You're, you're very familiar with this ageing society story. It's one that you know, I was taught as an undergraduate way back in the mid-1980s. And I hated this lecture. Lots of reasons why I hated it. One of them was it was really negative, you know? It's it sort of roughly, this is a sort of a, a, a straw version of it in macro, but it says falling birth rates, more people living for longer, there's more old people, there's a change in the age structure of the population, and that's bad news, you know? Old people are a problem, they don't work, they need a pension, they get ill and they cost a lot, and because there's a lot more of them and fewer younger people, it's a burden on all the workers. And that's kind of the, the main way of doing it. And if you think about it, wow, that's a miserable way of looking at one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. You know, fewer children lost in infancy, fewer parents snatched away in midlife, more grandparents meeting their grandchildren. But there is in macro, it's one of the biggest problems we've got. This series of conferences I noticed is called Global Economic Challenges, and aging is seen as a challenge. And halfway through this, uh, this lecture, there's a slide which got me to stop, which said, on average, we're living longer and we're healthier for longer. Now, I realize there's lots of complexity around that slide, and averages are very misleading, particularly when it comes to aging, but it just sort of made me stop and go, that sounds quite good. You know, on average, we're living longer, we're healthier for longer. How have we turned that into a resolutely bad news story? And it just got me thinking about how we might adapt and adjust to longer lives. And that's what I mean by longevity. Yes, there's a big focus on a change in the age structure of the population. But what if we could change how we age? And that's what I mean by longevity. And I started then looking around and saying, well, actually, I see loads of ways in which we're changing how we're aging. You know, not just health, but in terms of our behaviours and what people do. And it was a time when I just lost my parents and I could see my children doing very different things from me. I was doing different things from my own parents. And you could just all around and say, OK, this isn't working out exactly as people said when I was an undergraduate and an ageing society. Some things are changing. So I spoke to my colleague, who we were doing a sort of fundraising tour for London Business School, Linda Granton, who works in our organisational behavioural department and focuses upon HR, employment. And she said, yeah, I can see things working out differently too. And we decided to write a book, a non-academic book. And the book was called The Hundred Year Life. And I was motivated for the title because then the uh, UK statistical agency, the ONS, said at the time that there was a, a one in three chance of a child born today living to 100. They've now downgraded their projections to about one in five. But it was like, well, how would you cope with a hundred year life. What does it mean for work and careers? And that playful book has become a global bestseller. After 22, it's now sold over a million copies worldwide. And it was the success of that that kind of got me interested in this. 
and thinking, I better switch my research because nothing I've ever written on monetary policy has sold a million copies. So you know, <laughs> perhaps uh, you know, this is going to be the way for me. It also got me out and about meeting all sorts of interesting people. N not that central bankers aren't interesting, <laughs> no, please, uh, uh, don't, you know, don't misunderstand me. Um, but, you know, I'd meet Jarrah scientists who would say, hey, look, here's this worm, I've made it live ten times longer. Here's a mouse, I've reversed aging. And then you would sort of see people trying to support people working for longer or dealing with the care problems. I didn't meet many economists, but it, we could see that we had to adapt and adjust to aging. We talk about climate change, you talk about AI, we talk about adaptation and adjustment. Macroeconomics, like, ah, it's an aging society, there's all these old people, we can't do anything about it. You know, we, we talk about changing the state pension age and get more people to work for longer, but it's a problem. So I thought, okay, how do I come back into economics? In particular, how do I talk to the policymakers? And what's really interesting, when you talk about debt management or interest rates and inflation, it's pretty easy to talk to senior policymakers. When it comes to ageing, you're talking to much more junior people, sort of in less important parts of the organisation. So that's why I'm thrilled to be at the Bank of Spain today, talking about longevity. Now, I said I'm going to do a slightly different talk. I've got no chance of getting through everything in the, you know, the half an hour I've got left or whatever it is. And of course, one of the great ironies of talking about longer lives is I always run out of time. Um, uh, but I'm just going to see how it goes. But it's going to be a weird mix of sort of this high up and then delving into some academic papers I'm working on at the moment. So buckle up and let's uh, go for the ride. Let me begin just by just trying to draw a somewhat artificial distinction between ageing society and longevity society. And I've really got the macro community in mind here. And I know there's many of you who work great subtlety and nuance on ageing. So uh, I'm not so much at, uh, shooting at you. Then saying why I think macro should take this issue much more importantly. And then because it's a central bank talk, I'm going to talk about monetary policy. I can bring longevity and monetary policy back together again. Okay? So, you know, here's a slide. We've seen versions of it all the way through today. United Nations estimates of the world population from 1950 projected to 2100. And whenever you look at this chart, the demographers tell you two things. The first is, wow, look at that big increase in the world population. Yeah. Last November, the world population reached 8 billion. There was a child born in Indonesia who was the 8th billionth person in the world. I kind of want to know why they know that was the 8th billionth person. But anyway, 8 billion people in the world. When Malthus wrote his book saying that the world would struggle to support a large population, he didn't put any numbers and dates in, but the world population was about a billion. Wow, 8 billion people. And the second thing is you draw a line across. I'm 58, so I'm going to draw it at 60. So forgive me if I offend anyone. But 60 is going to be my cutoff point for old. Okay? And what you see, of course, is a huge increase in the number and the percentage of old people. And that's the ageing society story with the premise that these people are not economically active and they have bad health and that's the, the, the so-called burden. Uh, I thought I'd just do the Spanish data. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, so, of course, Spain has not just a rising number and proportion of older people, but also this dramatic fall in the population going forward as well. And there's a whiff of sort of, if you like, Malthusian uh, uh, economics in when we talk about an ageing society. It sort of says... You know, not that the population is outstripping our ability to support it, but our lifespan is outstripping our ability to support it. And we're going to see a fall in the standard of living. That's sort of the flavour of the ageing society story. Now, I'm going to say that, actually, if you look at this, I think there's an even more stunning way of looking at it. And it's a bit of an abuse, but I'll, I'll show you the proper data later. And that's just to draw a line going upwards. And what's the really big change? Yeah, there's a lot more old people. But the really big change is the probability of the young and the middle age becoming old or even very old. That's what's the really big change. We can talk about a change in the age structure of the population, but the length of life we can expect to have is changed dramatically. And that's a very, very fundamental thing to change. And I'm going to tell you that economics says we're going to behave differently because of it. So we're going to change and possibly adjust and adapt to the needs of this longer life. So let me do it by showing you survival curves. Uh, now, the area under a survival curve is life expectancy. So these are based uh, around mortality rates. So the survival rate between 0 and 1 is 1 minus mortality rate in that first year. Survival rate from 1 to 2 is 1 minus the mortality rate in that second year. Uh, and if you add them all together, that I say, the area under the curve, you get life expectancy, which is one of the 
most incorrectly named variables I can think about because it's basically the average age of death in a year is what we call life expectancy. And these are what are called period measures of life expectancy. I'm just so, you know, the 2021 curve is the mortality rates, based on mortality rates in 2021. It doesn't forecast any future changes. And what you can see in these survival curves is two things. The first is a, a truly extraordinary sort of rectangularization that's beginning to happen. You know, this is quite phenomenal. A, a newborn can have a very high probability of now living to 60. And I, you know, I, I, I'll be personal, because this, I think, is a, a trend that is incredibly personal. I was born in 1965, and I was an identical twin, and my twin brother died in the first few days. And I've just got a book coming out next year, and I was looking at the data, and I was staggered to find in 1965, the most common age of death in the UK was less than one. Today, it's 89. So in my lifetime, the modal age of death has gone from naught to 89. That's quite dramatic. But that rectangularization means that, you know, you're, you're highly likely to hit 70. And what you also see is an elongation. That endpoint is being dragged out. Your probability of hitting 90, etc., is rising quite dramatically. It's a combination of the rectangularization and the elongation. Now, this elongation stuff is really quite important because you're probably aware, a lot of people say to me, ah, oh, but life expectancy trends are slowing down often with reference to the US, which is seen as very abnormal amongst high-income countries. But actually, it's true, life expectancy trends are slowing down. They used to sort of rise two years every decade. It's about one year every decade now in the high-income countries. But that one year every decade is because you can't really get any further life expectancy improvements from improvements in survival rates below 60. So actually, nearly all the life expectancy gains now in high-income countries are coming from mortality rate declines over 70. So now all the life expectancy gains are really about longevity. Not about your chance of hitting 60, but your chances of hitting 80 or 90. The second thing that's interesting, if you look at those mortality trends, there's some evidence that the rate of improvement in mortality at 70, 80, 90 is actually increasing. So if anything, the real longevity trends are actually speeding up. Life expectancy trends themselves are slowing down because you really can't do much better, not to 60, thankfully. But now it's all about this extra longer life, more time. So if you like, there's two things happening. We've got the majority living to 70. Global life expectancy is now 71. But now we're actually getting increases chances of going beyond that. So why is that important? Well, you know, economics likes resources. We've got a bigger time endowment. I, as a 58-year-old, should be making very different decisions from my father or my grandfather at 58 because of the expected time I have to go in front of me. And it's not just life expectancy at birth that's rising. As we've seen, it's life expectancy at 65 that's also increasing. That should lead to changes in behavior in what I do. And I think you know, the challenge we've got with the aging society is we, we focus on chronological age. And I can talk wonderfully about chronological age. For most of human history, we haven't known how old we were. It's only when government started record keeping and numeracy and literacy increased, we started to say, oh, you're born on that date and that's how old you are. Even the song Happy Birthday is a 1930s invention, by the way. Uh, so most of the human history, we haven't known how old we are. But it's a very convenient bureaucratic device. And we've used it to structure life such that you know, you're a child, then you're an adult, then you have retirement. So we have this sort of education, work, retirement pattern. And it's very much based around chronological age. But look at those two things. At 58, I should be making different decisions from my grandfather at 58 because I've got more time ahead of me, what's called prospective age. And the average Brit has never been so old, but never had so long left to live. I'm not sure I can unambiguously call that an ageing society. It's more complicated than that. The second thing that this says is we will change how we age, because how we age is malleable. Now, some of that is obvious in terms of employment and saving decisions, but also it's obvious about health. The very fact we have inequality in health and life expectancy shows us that ageing is malleable. It may not be all about individuals, you know, the social or economic environment matters, but we can change how we age. And if you spend time with a the geroscientist, they'll say we can change it even more than you think. So we've got us a little bit confused about age. We focus too much on chronological. We don't focus on uh, the malleability of age and prospective age. And of course, one reason we fear an aging society is these life expectancy gains are now happening much more in years when health is bad. This is data showing the green line is a global burden of disease data set. The incidence of diseases by age, 
uh, and then you've got the survival rates. And clearly the relationship between life expectancy gains and health is deteriorating. So we can say, hold on, do we want to carry on living much longer? You know, what about health? We are worried about this health burden that's opening up. And so, of course, one of the most important things, and I've got some uh, work uh, trying to put some economic numbers on this, and I'll, I'll refer to those later, is what can we do to lower that age-related disease burden? Aging-related diseases are the biggest cause of disease and death uh, in, in the world right now and in uh, every, anything other than low-income countries. And trying to lower the incidence of age-related diseases is absolutely key. And I'll come back to that thing later. So that's one way we can think about changing how we age. But of course, there's loads of other ways too. And forgive me, this is where I slip into my business school slide now. But you know, there's a rather unique moment happening in human history. For the first time ever, the young can expect to become the old. There's always been old people, and old people have always been young. But it's always been a minority who have reached that age. And I'll show you in a minute, it's no longer the minority. It's the majority. So that's a tremendous achievement in society and our health system. We've got the majority of born can now expect to live a long life. But now begins the second change. We have to change how we age. That hasn't been a priority before because we didn't have such a high chance of becoming old. But now it is. And that's about changing possibly our health, but also our mortality as we age differently. So here's what I think is a really blindingly obvious point. And if you write any economic model, you can see it's blindingly obvious. This is the probability of a 20-year-old in Spain reaching age of 70, 80, or 90. And these are a period of ones. I'm not forecasting any improvements, which if you look at the improvements that happened, I clearly should do. You know, a 20-year-old today, looking at their probability of reaching 90, there's bound to be quite a lot of progress the next 70 years, or well, I hope there will be anyway. But this is what I'm saying. The probability of the young now becoming old is now a majority. I always give a metaphor. I live in London. I like London, but it rains all the time. Uh, and so I look at the weather forecast. If the weather forecast is a 10% chance of rain, I don't take an umbrella or a raincoat. If it's a 30% chance of rain, I'll pack a small umbrella. 70% chance of rain, raincoat and umbrella. What on earth am I talking about? This is kind of like the probability of a 20-year-old reaching 90. When it was 10%, we'd best not bother about structuring a society to support old people. We're not going to have many of them. That's not when we're young, invest in resources that make sure we're healthy when we're old, because it's not going to happen. But now, it will. We need the sort of gerontology equivalents of that, you know, what are the interventions and when should they occur that maximize my, my chances of aging well? Because it really, really matters. In a long life now, aging well is important. But it's, again, it's not just health. You can think about, you know, I, I started playing around with models, but it's just so obvious it's perhaps not even needed. Take a simple life cycle model with a fixed lifespan of T, and increase tea. Consumption changes. Now, it depends a lot upon what you do with the retirement age, what the risk aversion parameters are, but you get non-neutral changes. In fact, even if you assume that retirement is fully indexed to life expectancy, so the proportions of life you spend working remain the same, consumption is still non-neutral. It's because your, your savings has got more time to compound, and you know, both when you're working and afterwards. So you get non-neutral effects. David's got a lovely paper about optimal retirement. If I've got to live for longer and I trade off the marginal utility of work with the marginal uh, uh, costs of work, then of course, as I have to live for longer, my money's got to be spread more thinly. So the marginal utility of consumption rises, which means the marginal disutility of work has to rise. I work for longer. So there's all sorts of optimal responses. Again, if I've got a, a, you know, 58, I've got to think about having much longer years ahead than my grandfather, I need to think much more about my health. I've got to behave differently. I'm sort of younger for longer if you want to be really popular. Education, too. There's a lovely paper that says, well, um, you know, if we're living for longer, there'll be more overlapping generations. There's more scope to interact. You know, what if Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates are all alive together? Wouldn't that be great? So we need to invest more in human capital because the returns to human capital are higher. All of these suggest that T would change pretty fundamental features of the economy. Savings, health, education. All of which will affect growth. And, you know, I'm not saying this is all about longevity, but I do like these numbers suggesting change is already happening. This is just between 1990 and 2019. Of course, loads of other things have changed in the UK other than just life expectancy. 
But these are all consistent with some of the implications you expect from economics of living a longer life. More education early on, big increase at the age at which you uh, uh, give birth to your first child. You are now more likely in the UK as a woman over 40 to give birth than a woman under 20. That's quite a remarkable shift. Um, uh, people are getting married later, uh, divorces are happening later. I can't get the raw data, but I'm told that the fastest rising age group for divorce in the UK is 80 plus. Uh, now, I can't think of a, a sort of a better statistic about longevity than a statistic like that. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of a bit misleading, low base and all that sort of stuff, but this is a changing life cycle. So, two things are happening. Aging society, a change in the age structure of the population. Secondly, there's changes in how we age. And I want to call that second one the longevity society. How can we invest in it to actually get a dividend? How can we make these longer lives healthier for longer and productive for longer? Because that should be good for the economy. This should be a source of growth, not a negative. And of course, it's also just good for welfare. So I, you know, I won't do too much about this, but aging society tends to be negative, longevity society more positive. Aging society is always about end of life. Longevity society is about all of life. You know, what are the interventions? Probably in utero, that actually help you age better. Not, there's going to be certain key points in life that will be absolutely key here. Because if you think about rising life expectancy, it's the young have got the biggest challenge here, not the old. And of course, if we can invest in this, we can avoid the sort of doom loop of an aging society where we don't invest in later years enough and then say, oh, old age is a burden. Well, how can we solve it? So, time for some maths. Um, Take any variable x. Uh, lifespan of t, x depends on your decision about x, say consumption, depends upon your age, a, and t, your lifespan, and f is the distribution, uh, you know, the distribution of numbers across different age bands. So aggregate x is simply just an aggregate across everyone. Let's assume the only things that are changing are demographics, which is lifespan, and the parameters z that drive the density function, f. Okay? So what have we got? Well, Aggregate x is going to change because of shifts in the distribution, uh, z. And so that first term on the left says, aging society, you're putting more weight on older years and lower weight on younger years. And for most economic variables we're interested in, x is lower at older ages. Or, you know, productivity is lower, employment is lower, health costs are higher. But it's kind of all bad news, basically. By the way, another problem in economics is we assume that nothing improves with age, which I don't think can be right. We've sort of medicalized age quite a lot. On the right-hand side, how does X change when you change T? Well, there's two bits. How individual decisions at every age change with respect to T. And then, of course, you're going to get more people at the end because you've got, you know, if you go from 80 to 90, you've got people living from 80 to 90 you need to add. And the ageing society story picks up on that first term and that third term. And they're all sort of bad news stories, basically. You know, there's more centenarians, there's, there's more people in declining health. But they don't focus on that DXDT part. How do economic decisions change if I have a longer lifespan? And the point I want to make is I think that's the most interesting bit. Even if none of this is important, I think that's the most interesting part about it. You know, the fact there's more old people, yeah, okay, it's sort of has some gender equilibrium issues, but it's not sort of partial equilibrium. And I want to sort of stress about that too, because one of the things I find fascinating about longevity, and I was talking uh, earlier to Olympia, this is the most personal of trends, you know. Climate change, AI, incredibly important, big trends that you know, the future of human society hinges around. But so does how we adapt to longer lives. But this is personal, because the big change is you're all likely to become old. So this is about your ageing. And in the summer, I was giving a talk to a Chinese business school who came through London, sort of tw late 20s, early 30s MBA students. And of course, China has a really ageing society. And I was showing them these charts of 2050 and 2060 and all these older people. And I said, well, you know, how do you feel about this? Oh, it's terrible, all these old people. You know, they're, they're going to be a burden and we're going to have to care. I said, OK, so who are they? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, who are these old people in 30 years' time? They say, well, they're just the people, the old people. I said, no, they're you. And it's quite remarkable how we disassociate this trend from us as individuals. This is about your future, which is now much more longer than it used to be, and how do we adapt? 
Economics, I think, certainly macro struggles with all this. Um, the typical life cycle model, I love James's presentation earlier on, the typical life cycle model has three stages, and the, sort of the third retirement has very few interesting economic decisions. There's no labor supply decision, there's no uh, savings decision, you're just going to stop work and run down your savings. So it's kind of been a bit neglected, which is why it's great to see James and Elster and data sets like that say, we better understand what these people do. Overlapping generations models, I have to say, I've never understood OLG models, so this is probably my fault, not their fault. But they also tend to focus much more on changing weights rather than length of time. And then, you know, to the extent to which macro does do time, we have things like the infinite lived consumer, and we love stationary problems. But if I live forever and ever, I don't think I'd make the same decisions every single period, would you? You get bored stiff doing the same thing every day. You want to mix things up and mess around a little bit, you know? Uh, Borges has got a book saying, God, it'd be terrible to live forever. You'd be so bored. You'd have done everything. Winston Churchill, when he died in his 90s, said, I'm bored, I'm ready. But, you know, do, do people change their preferences as they get older? Aging isn't just about declining health. There's surely some inbuilt non-stationarity of preferences that we need to try and understand. Uh, I've mentioned about perspective and biological, but here's the claim. Longevity has high-dimensional, first-order, nuanced impacts on growth, employment, productivity, innovation, health, and education. If we assume we can do nothing about aging, we're going to ignore the potential we can exploit. So we need a three dimensional longevity dividend. We've already got longer lives. How do we make them healthier for longer and productive for longer? And by the way, just raising the state pension age does nothing to make people more productive. Okay? It doesn't maintain their skills. It doesn't maintain their health. It just forces them to carry on working. So, because um, I'm told I've got 10 minutes, I hope I've got 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Life expectancy has increased since we started. Can I get 11? No. Um, uh, just a few policy things, and then I'll, I'll try and come back to some, some macro stuff. Uh, in, in fact, I won't do this. Yeah. This is from a paper with Martin Ellison Oxford and David Sinclair at Harvard using a standard murphy Tapel model to try and put value on longevity versus health, healthy life expectancy. And the thing that is overwhelmingly clear is that we need to compress morbidity. And the welfare gains from doing this are staggeringly large. Think about COVID, where we shattered the economy to save lives. Well, the biggest health challenge is health-related disease. It is overwhelmingly important to make sure healthy life expectancy matches life expectancy. That has to be really a number one priority. Uh, labor markets, um, here's, you know, I think just phenomenal. In the most uh, rich countries in the 10 years before COVID, somewhere between two-thirds and 125% of employment growth came from older workers. This is a combination of a big cohort and an increase in the participation rate. So this is the US, the 30 years, the increase in jobs, the big increase came from workers aged over 50. How did the market absorb that? What have been the implications? How do we support it more? Um, and you know, for me, I want to focus on that 50 to the state pension age there's too many people who leave the labour market. Raising pension age is complicated. It's inequality issues, it's politically unpopular. A load of more people leave the labour market between 50 and, and the state pension age than at the state pension age. So what are the health and education investments and how do we target them? Because there's a big boost to GDP if you can try and do that. Um, top left is taken from a paper I wrote with Darren Asimoglu and Nikolai Moorback, and we looked at... Um, what job features older people like and how jobs have become more age-friendly. The good news is jobs have become much more age-friendly. Much more employment is now in the higher quantiles of age-friendly jobs. So that's been one of the reasons why we can support people working for longer. But there's some interesting issues here because as people work for longer, it has knock-on effects elsewhere. There's a lovely paper by Anki and Paradisi using Italian data that shows a kind of a blockage effect. Actually, older workers are doing quite well with wages relative to younger workers. The gap has really widened over the last 30 years. I'm doing some work with Darren and Julian Ashwin and David Alter, uh, and we're looking at sort of related and similar things. And the increase of older wages relative to younger wages is pretty constant across all educational categories. There sort of seems to be a way that older workers are grabbing the better occupations and the younger workers are struggling coming behind. As an academic, I wouldn't recognize that, of course, but uh, uh, you know, there are real implications. How do we make sure that we support longer careers, but in a way that's 
intergenerationally fair. Uh, and then this is just how we uh, maintain productivity. This is one of my favorite charts. This is looking at bioscientists a number of years out in their, from uh, PhD and how novel publications are. And the longer you are in your career, the less novel your publications are. But that red line area here, that's the most fertile area. And that comes about when you've got a young first, uh, 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 you basically do intergenerational mixing. People have got different skills, intergenerational diversity should encourage innovation. But how do we structure society to be less hierarchical, more intergenerational, to make the most of that innovation? And uh, now I'll briefly in my five minutes, I'll talk about monetary policy. Um, huge central banking agenda, which has come to the fore recently in the UK and United States. Because employment of older workers is now so important, they have a big supply side impact. And the UK and the US, one of the reasons central bankers were surprised by inflation uh, was just big changes in the participation rate of older workers. It caught them out. So we've now got longevity effects having first order macro effects. But the other area we hear a lot about is R star, this sense of the equilibrium interest rate. What should the equilibrium interest rate be? And this is where I'm trying to build a model with Julian Ashwin and Martin Ellison trying to illustrate an aging society versus a longevity effect. So central bankers have used uh, an aging society a lot to explain falling real interest rates the last 20, 30 years. And the logic is pretty simple. You know, if you've got more people saving with more wealth, there's more money going to financial markets, so interest rates are low. And if you've got a shrinking workforce, the capital labor ratio is high, so the marginal product of capital is low. So this is this, the explanation about why we've had low real interest rates, which of course aren't so low anymore. Um, now, what's unusual, by the way, about this uh, claim is, in general, certainly fiscal policy. So if you look at the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, or the Office of Budget Responsibility in the UK, when they do their long-run fiscal forecast, they will start with demographics. And they will paint the story of this aging society because of increases in the old age dependency ratio. I know very few historical analysis that use the rising old age dependency ratio to explain anything historically. It's always about the future. But in the UK, over the last 100 years, the old age dependency ratio has tripled from 10 to 30%. Over the next 50 years, it's going to go from 30 to 45. It's going to rise by 50%. If tripling, no one explains that's why we've got slowdown in growth, but for some reason, another 50% is going to have a big increase. Demography is not destiny. We adapt and adjust. But this is the story about uh, our star. Well, what if you've got a longevity effect? Because I said earlier that if you're living for longer, consumption changes. If consumption goes higher, then you have a different result. So what about you know, this longevity agenda? So let's think about trying to bring in a very simple model. Life expectancy T depends on delta. So if delta increases, you live for longer. There is a retirement age, R, and R relative to lifespan is fixed, which rises also with life expectancy. And if theta is equal to 1, you've got what we call productive aging. The, the, the proportion of life that you spend working remains constant. And then we're going to have a massive agent. So we have a very simple story here. We've got a, a, a 1 plus phi t, where t is age. So if phi is 0, you've got a uniform distribution. Phi is negative, you've got a young uh, age population. If phi is uh, positive, you've got an old society. So we can try and look at changes in delta and changes in phi in a simple, basic macro model to see what these different effects are. Uh, I'll skip that because I haven't got time. In terms of Japan, Spain, and USA, um, this is trying to fit phi, the slope of the age distribution, and T is the final point. It's like a sort of sense of sort of uh, upper bound for life expectancy. And you can see that these aging society and longevity trends are very different across countries. So in the US, you haven't got anywhere near as much of an aging society as you've got in Spain and Japan, where the Spain, you can see the distribution of ages is now tilted towards older people going forward. In America, it's gone from being tilted towards the young to being a sort of almost more uniform. You also, as we saw today, we haven't seen big increases in life expectancy as much, so the T is also bigger in Japan and in uh, uh, Spain. So different countries have different effects of longevity and aging. Um, part of the more old people is coming about because of the baby boomers. 
And this breaks down the change in the average age of society between a change in the uh, age distribution versus a change in lifespan. You can do a decomposition. And what you can see is that going forward, the longevity of stuff will become more important relative to the, the age cohort size, which is a boomer uh, echo. Let me try and go through this in heroically. Um, what I've talked so far is about partial equilibrium. How do people respond to their life cycle planning response to T? Let's think about how consumption in the economy responds to aging. I'm interested in consumption because this is savings, and that's going to be a key part of the R star story. There is no effect of my individual consumption from an aging society story in terms of my life cycle. It may be with caring and things of that form, but basically there being more old people in the world doesn't change in partial equilibrium, my consumption decision. So aging society and monetary policy only has an effect through general equilibrium. If there's more old people and it changes the interest rate, well, the interest rate will change my consumption, and so I have an effect. With the longevity society uh, effect, consumption depends on longevity. It does depend a bit upon the model, but often you get a positive increase. If I live for longer, it uh, depends on what happens to productive aging, my consumption rises. And then you've got all sorts of interesting stuff, but the effect of longevity on the interest rate seems to be ambiguous. This is work in progress. I wish I could tell you that it was one thing or the other and under what condition. But the net result is that whilst aging always has a negative effect on interest rates uh, in general equilibrium, longevity effect can have positive and it can be big enough to offset the aging society story. In other words, when you've got a macro model and you have two things, changes in the age structure of the population, and changes in how people age, the effects on interest rate is ambiguous. And it's kind of blindly obvious, because of course, if we carry on working for longer and we have more capital and we're more productive, of course we're going to see an increase in our stuff. Exactly what the balance is varies a lot. And this will be my last slide. I like this slide, because what we've got here is different general equilibrium results from a work in progress of what happens to interest rates depending upon whether you have a longevity effect or an aging society effect. Where it's red, interest rates go up. Where it's blue, interest rates go down. The more red, the more interest rates go up. The more blue, the more interest rates go down. And in good economic fashion, you can see the impact on our style depends. Why is this important? Because different countries have got different mixes of longevity and an aging society. And the more you can make the most of longevity and seize the opportunity rather than the challenge, the more you get positive effects on growth, positive effects on welfare, and positive effects on interest rates. Uh, then there's some terribly badly scanned charts that try and show this across countries, but I will stop there and briefly conclude. No, I won't. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, at least five minutes for questions. Uh, Manolo. That was a fascinating talk, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a measurement question, uh -huh. right? I mean, the, the, at one point, you, you, you talk about uh, the big difference between uh, one more year of life expectancy and one more year of healthy life expectancy, right? Yeah. I mean, this, this is something that, that we learned in Spain uh, when we started to to do the survey of health aging and retirement in Europe, and it was kind of shocking, right? Yeah. Because we were aware that uh, life expectancy in Spain was good, but, but then we, we discovered that uh, healthy life expectancy we were not doing uh, well at all, right? And now the, the measurement question is, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, modeling and collecting statistics and so on, don't, is it not a, a message of uh, your thinking that we should aim to, 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 to start thinking about two different capital T's, totally. right? And, totally. and this has to inform our collection yeah. of data and yeah. the parameters that, yeah. uh, that come into our uh, modeling thinking about things? Completely. Because, you know, I went back to that thing about, you know, on average we're living longer and we're healthier for longer. You know, are you glass half empty or half full? Uh, you know, oh, great, I've got more years in good health, I've got more years in bad health. That's what it means to have the 
proportion of life that is healthy broadly constant, perhaps slightly declining. So, of course, the best thing is to have the glass full and then to make sure healthy life expectancy catches up. And that was, you know, I very briefly rushed past it, but the paper with Martin and David in Nature Aging is exactly just showing, wow, if you use standard health tools, longer life's great, but healthy life is just unbelievably important. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I see this as a very simple syllogism. The data says that you are now, if you're young and middle-aged, likely to become the very old. We fear getting old. We fear outliving our health, our skills, our finances, and our relationship. So now, what do we do now to make sure we don't outlive it? But health has to be absolutely key. So I think, you know, what's interesting, again, I went perhaps to about it in the policy session, we've got a health system that's not really aimed at health. It's about treating diseases and illness. So we need to have a lot more incentives to focus on healthy life expectancy. Because most of the life expectancy gains are now coming after 70, that becomes ever more important. You know, when life expectancy gains were driving us from 50 to 60, that's fine because health's okay and we're still employed. But when it's 70 to 80, wow, well, we've got to think about that. So that's why we have to change how we age uh, or stop carrying on this increase in, in life expectancy. So I think healthy life expectancy should be an absolutely key government indicator. There's some problems with that. The first is, how do you measure healthy life expectancy? I'll give a flippant answer. Which it's pretty complicated to measure GDP, and we imagine it. We imagine it. So we must be able to do something with healthy life expectancy. But that's in the question, what are you interested in? Is it health? Is it functionality? What things do people focus on? And it becomes much more nuanced, but 100%. I don't think there's any point in just living longer in declining health. Uh, in Gulliver's Travels, there's a character called the Strudbergs who live forever in diminishing health, and they live their whole life in fear because they know at some point they're going to just be uh, terrible. You know, age 500, you're going to be terrible. So we have to make sure that we're healthy. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for this talk. Um, it was like, I really enjoyed it. You covered a lot of things. So. Um, <laughs> Maybe I misunderstood something, but, but Tito, before, you know, an important argument was like immigrants, I think we economists agree on that, immigrants don't take jobs, the number of jobs is not fixed. Now, you said it seems like when we let older people work for longer, it made it sound a little bit like, oh, but they are taking mm. the jobs mm. of these younger generations. In, in what, so I think yeah, as yeah. economists, we have to agree on one or the, or the no, other. No, I agree. And uh, so I, I, I have to say, I don't like that result. Because I've always said, when people have said, if older people work longer, it takes jobs from the young. I've always said, well, yeah, it's a lump of labor fallacy. That's wrong. And it is wrong, because it doesn't create unemployment. It does change the type of jobs that people can do. That's what the data suggests. It's one reason, by the way, I think age-friendly jobs are important, because age-friendly jobs should increase the supply of older workers, make it easier for them to work. And because older workers are more keen to take those jobs, it shouldn't act as competition for the jobs that younger people are going for. But a market will tell you, if you increase supply, you're going to get effects on wages, for instance. And if, you know, there's, in certain industries, there's a, a tunnel effect, you can't get more people, then you may find occupational choices affected. And the data at the moment seems to suggest there's evidence of that. Uh, and, you know, I think if you stick with a linear career path and then let people carry on working for longer, you've got a problem. So, you know, the, the basic measure of all of this is very simple, which is we designed in the 20th century a life that worked quite well for 65, 70 years but isn't coping very well with going to 85, 90, 95. Whether that be the health system, whether it be our pensions, or even our career paths. So how do we create that more flexible structure of work? So it's not saying unemployment, but it, yeah, it does, I think, it, the evidence suggests that there is effect on wages and the occupations that people go in. Uh, so there's intergenerational issues. Andrew, I have a question for you. Uh, Changing behavior requires changing beliefs about life expectancy. Yeah. And uh, I mean, your Chinese students couldn't imagine themselves yep. 30 years hence, uh, and, and beliefs are sluggish. I mean, things yep. like the legal age of requirement that you don't have in the UK, but we have uh, in other countries, and, and it's gone up by two years over a 20 year period or something like that. So, I mean, there no, is no. this uh, uh, sort of time inconsistency 
in this uh, issue, right? Because uh, yeah. you're learning slowly that uh, yeah. by that time it may be too late to sort of uh, reskill yourself, uh, right? So there, there's a whole bunch of issues there. Uh, and, and, you know, um, there's lots of ways to rub. First of all, I don't think change is going to be quick. You know, for all of you, this, the, you know, it is remarkable what has happened such that now average global life expectancy is 71. And you know, we've always think about, we, we underestimate the capacity of older people, we underestimate the capacity of our later years, uh, and that's kind of a bit of a long-running theme in human history. So that's not going to change quickly. So there's all sorts of social adjustments that have to happen. And I, say, I'm always, I always hate business school professors who come on stage and say we live at a time of unparalleled change, because in general I think that's nonsense. But I think when it comes to longevity, we are. You know, that we now face the fact that the young can expect to live a very long time. And so all our traditions of ageing, what we think about age, will have to change. And that's not going to be quick. Then there's sort of stuff like how individuals themselves can cope with it because we're not good at long-term planning. So how do we teach patients? You know, do, do we... You know, even think about the discount factor. Should you define the discount factor over a person's life or over a year? Because if you are living longer, we need to be more patient. We need to invest longer in the future. So, uh, yeah, I'm not in any way saying that we're going to change quickly or overnight. But I, and I think, as I say, the really key thing is understanding that age is malleable. And it's remarkable how resistant people are to that. Of course, I'm not saying it's infinitely malleable, but we change how we age. And once you accept, accept that, the implications for you personally are pretty strong, and then I think for society too. But I do think, by the way, in terms of the political narrative we have to have a more positive vision than an ageing society. Because if getting old is all about finding more people to look after care homes, I think you're always going to struggle to get the resources to do that. But if you can actually say, actually there's opportunities, and we are in some dimensions ageing better, and it's important to do so, I think that can have an effect. So I think also it's a question about narrative too. But it's, yeah, it's, it's big, it's huge. Okay, I think that... Uh we can uh, finish this uh, presentation. Thanks, uh, Thank you. Andrew. And, uh